Welcome to another episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast with your hosts, Sean Sorrentino and Aaron Paulette. Welcome to episode 130 of the Gun Blog Variety Cast, a proud member of the Self Defense Radio Network. How are you doing, Aaron? I am doing great, Sean. So I understand that you are a 10. I am. This is the only 10 I'll ever be, in fact. Curse you, Bo Derek. Uh, so for people who don't know what's going on, it means you don't read my blog for shame. But Wednesday, the 8th, was the 10-year anniversary of me blogging at Lurking Rhythmically. Where's the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. <laughs> and uh, I'm surprised by this because... Ten years is a long time to do anything, and this is the longest I have ever done anything. I didn't think I'd still be doing this <laughs> ten years ago. So, so you started blogging about ooh, three months after I started my current job, and I've never done anything in my life as long as I have been doing this job. Not even being married, which is only two weeks younger than the job. Oh, okay. Oh, I forgot to mention last week because I was very distressed by the whole Berkeley riots thing. Uh, I'd been talking about getting the root canal and how I was scared and not looking forward to it, and I just completely forgot about that whole mess. And again, if you want a more detailed analysis of what happened, I've got a post up on my blog called Sailing Down the Canal of Root. But the short version here is that I worked myself up for nothing. I got a fantastic endodontist. He had a just bright bubbly assistant who immediately put me at ease and I told him I was this gigantic chicken and they well they even did the thing where before they gave me the shot of the Novocaine they got the topical anesthetic and numbed the gum before the needle went in uh. and I didn't even feel the needle go in at all this guy knew his thing I have had fillings that hurt worse than this root canal well that's good to know Oh, it was just fantastic. It was just such a non-issue. I mean, I'm not saying I'm looking forward to another one of these things because I want to keep my teeth healthy. But overall, you know, if I had to, 10 out of 10 would root canal again. <laughs> and, you know, cute bubbly assistant. So there's that. Oh, my God. She, she was adorable. While we were waiting for the anesthetic to come in, we started talking about the Flash and Arrow on CW. So she was this wonderful, adorable nerdette. And we had this great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into how are you, how's your mom doing, Sean? As far as I know, she's doing fine. I've talked to her a couple times on the phone. She sounds nice and strong. And she actually sounds stronger and more forceful, I guess, more there than she did beforehand. So it wasn't like, you know, having a stroke in her eye and then a heart attack. It was good for her, but... Listening to her has done a lot to make me feel more, you know, I guess, comfortable. I'm like, okay, she's going to be okay. She sounds fine. She sounds strong. She's with it. She understands what's going on around her, and she's in charge of her life. So yeah, that's, that's nice. Yeah, that's great news. Now, uh, I expect she's still blind in one eye. That's likely to be permanent, yes. Yeah, and that's her primary eye, if I understand correctly. I have never checked to see if that was her dominant eye. It's her right eye, but... I. Beyond that, I can't tell you. I've never checked to see, well, you know, should you be shooting right eye dominant or left eye dominant or are you cross dominant? That's not something we ever got into. Well, what I'm getting at is how is she doing psychologically with the prospect of never going to be able to see out of that eye again? Uh, I don't know. Not a shrink. But it sounds kind of like she's in the same place that, that I am and like the eye took one for the team, you know? Okay. I don't know. Well, maybe you could ask her next time you talk. Well, I thought that would be kind of personal. She's your mom. It's okay. No. <laughs> well, mom, how do you feel about losing an eye? Well, no. Tell me about no, your I mother. No, I wouldn't put it like that. God, but, I mean, that's it, what it sounds like. Maybe. I'm like, no. No. If she, if she wants to talk about that, she'll tell me. <laughs> I, I don't need to know I, these okay, things. Maybe, maybe we just have different relationships with our mom, but I would be like, hey, mom, you know, how, how are you doing? Because... You know, you're you're blind in one eye now, and, and are you okay? Is okay. there anything I can help with? Let me with? tell you what that Just... sounds like. Let me tell you what that sounds like. You've suffered this terrible loss. Now tell me how horrible it feels. That's what that sounds like. <laughs> you know what? She lived. And that's all we can ask. 
hey, you know, she was dead. She was going to die. Like, she died. Who was going to stay dead? She's not. We're all happy with that. I can't imagine she's not going to be happy with that. And if she isn't happy with that, I'm really not the person to try to, because I'm not likely to be very nice about it. Y'all know me. If I think you're being dumb, I'm going to say so. And if she's like, oh, I feel terrible. I can't see out of one eye. I'm going to be like, you lived. Shut up. That makes me probably not very, I don't know, sympathetic, I guess. But (laughs) eh, what can I say? (laughs) I think Um, she's got a lot to be thankful for, and I think we should just leave it at that. Okay, that's fine. Speaking of things to be thankful for, thanks to Lucky Gunner and Remington for their support of the Gunblog Variety Cast. From Golden Saber to Range Rounds, get a full lineup of quality Remington ammo that ships fast at LuckyGunner.com. Well, let's get on with the show. A recent accident involving a child and a gun caused local media to reach out to Beth for comment. And this week, Beth talks about some of the tips and thoughts she has shared before and will continue to share with anyone who will listen about how to be safe with kids and guns. The other afternoon, I got a text message from a local news station who was contacting me because they wanted to ask me some questions as a firearms trainer, as someone who works very closely with moms and women and even children. A lot of times I get those kinds of phone calls. Unfortunately, this phone call was actually spurred because of an incident, a terrible accident that happened with yet another child who had injured himself with a loaded firearm. The sad thing is, these things can be prevented. And as I've said over and over again, the most important thing is education, not isolation. Now, granted, we can't always fix the problems when there are dangerous people in the house or there are dangerous people in the neighborhood or you happen to be in some kind of dangerous environment or scenario. But we can take control of our own firearms and our own habits. And even while I did not have an opportunity to call this particular news station back this time around, I do have some tips and tactics. I do have some information that I would have shared with them and that I will continue to share with anyone who wants to know how you can be safe around kids and guns. First and foremost, you have to watch those children. You can't just let little kids wander around your house and explore every nook and cranny. Granted, you should have safe stored solutions for your firearms, but we all know that you can't be basically everywhere at once, depending on how many kids you have or if there are neighboring kids, friends, or family members there, you can't be at all places at once. So it's very important that you watch these children, keep an eye out for them, and make sure that you have indeed secured your firearms and have been smart with firearms, whether loaded, unloaded, on your hip, or in a safe. The other thing when it comes to kids is you've got to keep it simple. If you are trying to teach them about firearms, you have to be careful what you say and how you say it. Especially with little kids, they can get mixed messages because they take things very literally. As well, they're always watching and there might be some behaviors that you don't want them to imitate. Along with that is don't trust their judgment. Don't trust the judgment of your kids or the lack thereof, especially those little ones. They're mobile, they're eager to explore, but they can't necessarily anticipate consequences. And they can't just anticipate them, they can't understand them. So you can teach your little ones some basic manners and you can teach them to stay away from firearms and no, don't touch and simple things like that. But keep in mind that they have no real concept of what is going to happen if they do something that they're not supposed to. Another tip is to be cautious when you have guests or if you're visiting others. You might have taught your own children what to do, but that doesn't mean every child in your home is going to understand or follow those same rules. The same thing goes if you are visiting others. What if those family members who have guns are not as vigilant and and not as careful or safe with the firearms in their home? Again, education, not isolation. If you have talked to your children about safety and you have gone over safety rules and you've gone over the fact that they're not to touch firearms under any circumstances, then hopefully all of these things are going to carry over no matter where they are. Along with that, be careful not to introduce guns too early especially with those really young children like toddlers, they're not really going to understand the difference between the real firearm and the water pistol even. As they get older, however, and they start to develop and they start to understand and they start to realize what consequences are and they start to realize, hey, there's actually more than just them in the world. 
then you can build on those layers of understanding and you can really start to teach them both physically and mentally what is proper and what is not when it comes to firearms. Of course, with that being said, you can follow all the safety rules all the time. Again, children are always watching, even if we think they aren't. So don't bend any of the gun safety rules. Don't take any shortcuts. Don't do something because it's convenient. Let your kids grow up in a household that is adamant and faithful about responsible gun ownership so that you are doing those things consistently and safely all the time. I mean, even if nobody is watching. The bottom line is you can live safely with children and firearms. I've said it time and time again, but that requires dedication. That requires commitment. That requires vigilance. That requires that you are actually going to do all the things that you say that you're going to do. That requires that you are going to pay attention. You're going to follow the rules and you're going to teach your children the best way that you know how so that you have given them the tools that they need knowledge-wise. You've armed them knowledge-wise with what they need to be safe in your home and out and about in the world. Do your best always to be a responsible gun owner. Until next time, stay safe and be well-armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on Pacifiers and Peacemakers in the left sidebar. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the Donate or the Subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly, and a little help from you is a big help to us. Felons behaving badly. North Carolina mom fights back. Kills home intruder in stabbing. Okay, so Sean, it sounds like he tried to stab her, but she stabbed him instead. Is that what's going on here? I think she applied the Mal principle. If somebody's trying to kill you, you can kill them right back. (laughs) Dateline, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Police said a woman stabbed a man who was trying to force his way into her home early Monday morning. Winston-Salem police officers responded to a home break-in around 3.30 a.m., on Bethabara Point Circle. Officers found a man, suspect, lying on the ground near his front door with a stab wound. Police said he later died at Wake Forest Baptist Health. Officers also found the woman who lives in the apartment there with her four children. None of them were hurt. Police said the woman was once in a relationship with suspect that involved domestic violence. Investigators believe suspect and the woman got into an argument that turned physical and that's when he forced his way into the home. Police said the damage on the door was consistent with being forced open. The investigation is ongoing. Okay, so he might have had a knife, he might not have had a knife, but either way, he tried to break in, and she stabbed him for his efforts. So, good for her. Didn't try. The door was forced open. Or to put it another way, he tried, and he succeeded. And then he did not. So, uh, what kind of gentleman caller forces his way into the residence of a former beau? Possessed Schedule 6, Misdemeanor, Class 3. Carry Concealed Weapon, Misdemeanor, Class 2. Larceny, Misdemeanor, Class 1. Possessed with Intent to Sell, Schedule 6, Felon, Class I. Three Counts, Possessed with Intent to Sell, Schedule 2, Felon, Class H. Sell, Schedule 2, Felon, Class H. Two Counts, Possession of a Firearm by a Felon, Felon, Class G. And... Habitual felon. Felon class C. So, Sean, when I hear habitual felon, that sounds to me like this guy has been convicted multiple times and then they just tack on another one, basically for good measure. Like, you keep coming back. You obviously haven't learned anything. We'll just keep you in longer. Exactly. In North Carolina, we don't really technically have a three strikes and you're out law, but that is a three strikes law. If you strike out three times you're going to get the big ticket, a class C felony. Now, to give you some idea, there's a class A felony is death or life in prison for the rest of your life. It's first degree murder. Class B1 and class B2 felonies are like first degree kidnapping, first degree rape. Class C felony is like, I think, second degree rape. It's that serious of an offense. So in this case, He got between seven and nine years extra in prison for being a third strike. Hmm. 
Well, apparently he just wouldn't take we're breaking up for an answer, and she had to deliver it at knife point. Baron is on assignment and will return soon. Hey, this is Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, host of the Armed Lutheran radio podcast, reminding you that the podcast you're listening to is a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Check out all the great content at selfdefenseradio.net. Main topic, Trump is not your hope and change. What? He's not? I, I was told that he was. I got sold a bill of goods. Unfair! Have you noticed, Aaron? That about six months before a major election, usually the presidential election, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of people just leap out of the woodwork to piss and moan. Oh, we never have any good candidates. Oh, the duopoly. Oh, this party and that party, they they just keep nominating the people that they want, and they never nominate somebody that I want to vote for. You're used to hearing that, aren't you? Oh, yeah, although I think it's been more than six months. Definitely in the case of this last election. I was hearing that as far back as 2015. This article, Trump is Not Your Hope and Change, comes from Firearms Policy Coalition, who has, I, you know, full disclosure, they have helped us out. They are, in fact, the people who sent us to GRPC last year, so big thanks to them. I saw this on Facebook. Brandon was sharing it out. Brandon Combs of Firearm Policy Coalition. And it really kind of encapsulates my thinking on this whole, okay, we've elected a president. Now we can all go back to sleep. I really get irritated. For the last six months, you just hear it over and over and over again. Oh, we have terrible candidates. Oh, we have terrible candidates. Where have you people been the 18 previous months? Because when the election is over, now it's time to get paid, right? You got your candidate. Your candidate has made promises. Now it's time to make that candidate make good on the promises, number one. So you need to be on him. And number two, where are you going to get those candidates for next time? Are you going to grow those candidates? Are you going to be those candidates maybe? Or are you just going to let the party serve you up whatever next person on the list there is, and now you can complain that there's nobody that you want to be your candidate, right? Well, to be fair, some people really enjoy complaining. You know, I think you're right. I wish they would identify themselves so I could know, okay, you're complaining just to hear yourself talk, and you're complaining because you're really upset about this and you don't understand why. Because honestly, if you're just complaining to complain, then you don't understand when I say, well, if you don't like it, you need to do this and this and this, because you're not asking for solutions. You're just complaining to complain, right? Yeah. So I wish those people, please, if you're just complaining to complain and you don't want to hear some positive solutions, maybe, then identify yourself so people don't, A, waste their time trying to give you a solution, and B, you know, irritate themselves when they find out that you weren't actually asking for solutions, you were just complaining. Now, this is really directed at the vast majority of our listeners who actually do care and actually do want things to get better and probably aren't just complaining to complain. Let me read a little paragraph here. Many gun owners believe that since Trump was elected, our worries are over. Don't get us wrong. With Trump's election, we have hope that significant gains can be made to restore Second Amendment rights. However, it's not an overnight or uncomplicated process. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like opportunity knocking but disguising itself as work? There's a quote that's supposedly attributed to Mahatma Gandhi about be the change you want to see in the world. And it sounds like that's what's going on here. Instead of having Trump be your hope and change, you be the hope and change you want to see in America. Right. But that's going to involve effort. It's not going to be slacktivism. I mean, okay, I will admit that I am guilty of signing online petitions because it makes me feel good. But I acknowledge that signing online petitions is not the only thing that needs to be done. I do that and other things. In fact, I have a little article here on petitions to repeal NFA, Hughes Amendment, garner 40,000 signatures in 19 days. Yeah, I totally signed those. I felt good doing it too. And I'm glad that you felt good doing it. But my question is, is what good did you do? Well, like I said, it made me feel better. (laughs) It made you feel better. Okay. See, that's the difference here. Are you doing something to feel good? Or are you doing something to do good? Are you bringing about some change here? Now, you were certainly telling the president, hey, this is important to a lot of people. You probably should do something about it. And there's always the possibility he will listen in between 
whoever he's offending on Twitter today. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, if they're going to be offended, you know, what, what, who's, who's responsible for your own offense, right? If you're offended, mm. it's your, you know, that's you. Not the president's job to not offend you. Now, it'd be nice if he didn't do it so often, but hey, you know. Okay. Take charge of your own offense. But what good came of that? What actually is going to happen? Now, you don't just sit around and do nothing. Obviously, you're part of the podcast, so you're spreading the information out. You're trying to gather people together to do things. We're definitely going to NRA annual meeting, and we're going to try to meet with people and just build that sort of team that gets things done, right? Absolutely. I'm involved here in North Carolina with Grassroots North Carolina, which if you were in North Carolina and you are not a member of Grassroots North Carolina, back up and regroup, get online, join it. If you're not a member of Florida Carry in Florida, what are you thinking? Well, I absolutely am. Not you, obviously, our listeners. I know you are. You're a sustaining member, aren't you? I am indeed. So, you know, you didn't just like, you know, one year. No, you gave like extra money and you're poor. So it's not like you have a lot of extra money. That money, that work that you do, I think Paul Valone, the president of Grassroots North Carolina, said that he needed three things from people. He needed money, he needed volunteers, and he needed time. Are you doing those things? Are you giving money to the people who need the money? Because these people don't have a billionaire who's backing them up, who's saying, hey, here's, here's spend all this money, do these things, pay people These are people that are doing it on their spare time. They're pure volunteers. And you know what happens to volunteers and volunteer organizations, right? Volunteer organizations, there's like a 90-10 rule. 90% of your problems come from 10% of your people. Well, the same thing works in reverse is that 90% of the work gets done by 10% of the people. And that's on a good day. So all you have to do is be one more person and how much more gets done. Trump is not your hope and change. You are. Here's some things that we need to pay attention to. Right now, we're focused on Sessions just got, what do you call it, confirmed Confirmed. as the attorney general. Yay, I guess. If it wouldn't have been him, there'd have been somebody else who was not actively trying to cover up running guns to Mexico. So my dog would have done a better job than the previous people. But coming up is the next big fight for the Supreme Court, right? Everybody's concerned about Gorsuch. Everybody says he's a great guy, he's got some good qualifications, but we know that they're going to fight tooth and nail, hammer and tong, because they thought that they were going to turn the Supreme Court 5-4 to the liberal side, and they didn't get it, so they're pissed off. But what nobody's paying attention to is that there are 118 total judicial vacancies in the United States right now, federal judicial vacancies. Just one of them is the Supreme Court. We have 91 vacancies on U.S. district courts, right? The circuit courts, the the, the courts underneath the circuit courts, I think. But 91 of them, 18 on the U.S. Court of Appeals. Who's going to appoint all of those 118 open judge vacancies? Who's going to appoint the people who are going to do those jobs? That's Trump, right? That's Donald Trump right there. And are we going to focus like a laser on the Supreme Court, while 117 other judges get appointed and confirmed? Or are we going to want those 117 other judges to be the sort of people who are going to judge on the basis of what the law says and what the Constitution says, instead of just making stuff up? Yeah, I see your point, and I admit that we should be concentrating on those other appointments. But part of the problem here is that The Supreme Court nomination is basically the Kardashians of politics. It's what everyone (laughs) is talking about, and no one really cares about what the people down the street are doing, even though the people down the street affect your life way more than whatever Khloe Kardashian is wearing today. Exactly. And actually, those appointments are, in a lot of ways, way more important than the Supreme Court. But cases only come before the Supreme Court if there is a disagreement between circuits, right? Because if they all agree, then there's no need for it to come before the Supreme Court. It's only when you've got differing verdicts across different parts of America that they go, hey, there's a conflict, we need to take it up to the Supremes. And more cases don't get before the Supreme Court than do. 
<laughs> so, by yeah. a huge factor. <laughs> it's not exactly true that there has to be a circuit split, but it is so common that that's the way to get there that you may as well assume that if there's no circuit split, you're not going to the Supreme Court. There's only nine people on the court. They can only take so many cases, what, 40, 60, somewhere in that neighborhood per year. And there's, I don't know how many cases, your case is not going to the Supreme Court. It's just not going to happen. If you get a bunch of activist judges who want to interpret the law, the living constitution, and make it up as they go, there's nobody to stop them. It's just not going to happen. The circuit court's probably not going to take it up unless there's some good reason to. And if the circuit court is full of a bunch of activists, they're definitely not going to take it up. Yeah. You're stuck. You want all of those judges to be the sort of people that you can trust, you can rely on. Yeah, it just seems to me that in general... Americans are way more focused on politics at the national level than they are at the state and smaller level, which is weird because, again, those are the politics that affect you more directly. That's a great point, Aaron. If I drive down the road and pull out a gun and randomly shoot into a building, am I going to end up in federal court? Really, only if you shoot up a federal building. Pretty much. I violated a state law. Well, who wrote those state laws? The legislators of the state. Right, signed by the governor of my state, right? So yeah. where does it make the most sense for me to be spending my time? At the state level. Exactly. And this has uh, another benefit, actually a national benefit, because the more states that change, the more likely it is for the federal government to recognize it. Um, so I recognize that uh, the legalization of marijuana is a controversial topic, but the more states that legalize it and just say, we're not going to prosecute this at the state level, the more the federal government is going to look at it and say, this may not be worth our time. The same thing is going on with concealed carry laws or constitutional carry laws. Um, I, I just read today that New Hampshire, the House passed a carry bill where you didn't have to have a license to carry. And so that would join it with, with Vermont and I think Maine. I'm not 100% sure here. Yep. But again, each victory at the state level shifts that Overton window over a notch. And enough shifts of those, and you've effectively got change at the federal level. Pretty much. That's the whole point of the way our government runs. Most stuff really needs to be handled by the states. And we need, as states, to take as much of our own responsibility as possible so that we're not shoving it off on the feds. Because I live fairly close to the Capitol. It's a four-hour drive from here to Washington, D.C. And I still don't want people living that far away telling me how I have to live my life. God help you if you live in some place like Nevada. Do you really want to listen to a bunch of yahoos that are three time zones away? No. So handle your business at the state level. Get involved. Definitely get involved at the state level. Make sure you're growing those candidates. Make sure you're showing a preference for the sort of candidates who want to get off your lawn. Make sure you're showing the president that not only do you want a Supreme Court candidate that you can trust and believe in, you want those 117 other judges to be of the same sort of stripe. Or who knows who he'll, he could appoint his sister because he feels like it. Why? Make sure to hold his feet to the fire. I want to close with. Something out of Firearms Policy Coalition's Trump is not your hope and change. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Just like in other aspects of your life, you have to take this on as a challenge. Any meaningful accomplishment that you've had in life was due to your own efforts. This is no different. Last week, Sean and I talked about not lumping all lefties and liberals in with the radicals and writers. This week, Tiffany explains what it's like to be lumped into that group and why it bothers her. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Till you climb inside of his skin, walk around in it. Hey everybody, I hope you're all doing well. So 
First, before anything, I have to give a great big ginormous shout out to Sean's mom. (laughs) If you listen to episode 129, you know that Sean's mother recently looked the Grim Reaper in the eye and gave him a great big giant middle finger. So Sean's mom, you are amazing for refusing to let a massive stroke and a widowmaker heart attack get in the way of you sending your son an email. (laughs) You are my hero and this little clip of music is for you. And while we're at it, everybody who heard Sean tell of his mom's adventures also heard about the wonderful, the magnificent, the glorious Ms. Elena Grace. She was the amazing ICU nurse who might be German or Swiss or Norwegian, (laughs) but more importantly, she's the person who leapt into action and saved Sean's mom when the Grim Reaper came a-knocking. So, Ms. Grace, this clip is for you. The church? Y'all didn't know we was going to church up in here. Yes, thank you so much, Nurse Grace, with the most befitting name ever. Thank you, thank you. And finally, I have to give a big shout out to Sean Sorrentino himself and to his wonderful co-host, Aaron Paulette, both of whom I am proud to call my very good friends. And it's not just because they had some really nice things to say about me (laughs) in episode 29, but it's uh, for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, getting back to Sean's mom, Sean handled his mom's near-death experience like an absolute pro. Totally amazing how he and his brother both stayed calm and like a well-oiled machine, they each immediately fell into their respective roles and did whatever was within their power to help without freaking out over what was entirely beyond their control. It was a masterclass in crisis management. So hats off to you, Sean, and your entire family. But while I'm giving praises to Sean, I also want to compliment him on the main topic from episode 129. I have got to just, I I can't even begin to say how much I appreciate everything that you said. And I'm sorry that this back and forth is a little bit attenuated by time gaps in the interim topics, but Sean and I are on different recording schedules. Otherwise, I would have included all this in episode 129. So sorry about that. But I have to say what Sean and Aaron discussed just cannot be echoed loudly enough. I do not have the words to express what a huge relief it was to hear Sean say those things, not just in corner conversations, but on the public stage. For those who missed it or who might not recall the main topic from episode 129, here are a few snippets of what Sean had to say. I'm seeing a lot of people on my Facebook who are saying, well, screw those guys. All liberals are like that. And this is, you know, this is a a problem of everybody on the left until they start denouncing it, that they're just our enemy. And I think we're making a huge mistake there. Do we really want to push people like Tiffany onto the side of a bunch of terrorists? If we treat all liberals the same way that we would treat these violent radicals, if we talk to our neighbors and our friends and our family members as if they are no better than the people who are burning down buildings in Berkeley, that's on us. And how many times do we have to push them and say, you're just like this, you're just like this, you're just like this, before they no longer care what we think? Now, if you weren't convinced by that segment, let me tell you, I I, I just, I have to reiterate that everything Sean said is true. He hit the nail right on the head. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I have heard and seen this very conversation play out. 
How many times I've been surrounded by friends or family, oftentimes mostly liberal, oftentimes mostly black or other minority races. And this whole issue comes up and boils to the surface and it's just maddening. Somebody will say something like, man, that Baltimore riot or man, that Berkeley riot was so damn stupid. They're hurting their own cause. Burning local businesses doesn't help a thing. It makes things worse, blah, blah, blah. And I'm giving a thumbs up for all of that. But then somebody else in the group says something like, well, at this point, it doesn't matter what anybody does anyway. They call us anarchists and terrorists and animals and stupid and everything else. And then somebody else says, well, they're not talking about all of us. They're just talking about the violent rioters, not the peaceful protesters. And then, of course, the the original dissenter retorts with something along the lines of, you know, you couldn't possibly be that naive. They're telling us that they hate us. Just take a look at their Facebook feed. They specifically say all liberals, everybody on the left. That's what they, they're telling you. Why would you doubt what they've actually put in black and white writing on the permanent record that is the Internet? And then they, the argument goes, you know, if, if they already think we're all animals, then why should we care what they have to say about anything else? They aren't listening to people like us, so we'd be fools to listen to people like them. So then I have to be the explainer and the translator, and then I get accused of sympathizing and even kissing up to people who hate me and all the rest. And of course, this whole debate spills over into the Second Amendment issue also, because when liberals feel like pro-gun people are the same folks who call all liberals stupid animals, then they put two and two together and they think, well, it's no coincidence that the folks who hate me also love guns and want guns in schools and churches and want to stockpile guns and guns, guns, guns. Hey, they're preparing for war and we'd be idiots to see it any other way. And who's going to be their target when the war breaks out? According to their Facebook posts, it's going to be me. So we can't let them keep accumulating guns because eventually they're going to turn those guns on me, blah, blah, blah. That's how this plays out. And then, of course, me being the person sitting in the middle most of the time, that's where I have to step in and play mediator and beg forgiveness for some of my own associates whose Facebook posts appear in my timeline where they're lumping everybody together and and branding all the violent protesters as liberals when it's not the same sets of people. It's just, it just unravels really, really quickly. So Sean, all I can say is amen, brother. Yes, yes, yes. In my humble opinion, everything you said is absolutely right. And I really, really, really hope that our listeners will take to heart everything that you and Aaron said. And now... I have some parallel advice for all of my friends on the left. You must be vocal about distinguishing peaceful protests from terroristic riots. One is the very lifeblood of this republic, and the other is a cancer that could rip the country apart. Even though rioters and protesters are often mixed together in the same places and at the same times, We have to draw a clear line between the two. We cannot be seen for one instant as condoning behavior that is even more destructive to our communities than whatever sparked the protest in the first place. So while I completely understand your frustration with people who summarily assume that you're in cahoots with all the bad apples, the longer you remain silent about those bad apples, the more credence you lend to those assumptions. If we're going to avoid reverting back to the dark ages of this nation's history, it's going to take all of us, no matter what your political stripe, no matter what quote unquote side you're on, and I even hate drawing those false dichotomies in the first place, but no matter where you stand on the continuum of these debates, it's going to take all of us swallowing a little pride giving a little benefit of the doubt, and taking the occasional leap of faith to actually listen to people with whom we disagree. And I think Aaron summed things up quite nicely at the end of Sean's segment. So basically, you are saying that the most effective way to deny aid and comfort to the radicals is to take away potential recruits by treating those potential recruits like human beings. Yeah, amazing how that works. Pretty much. That pretty much says it. 
not that complicated, right? So until next time, everybody, please stay safe and keep it centered and even. You can follow Tiffany at FrontSightPress.com. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Erin Paulette. Come on, everypony. It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Erin Paulette. I've talked about what the concept of tribe means in previous prepping segments, but I haven't yet touched on tribalism. Now, anyone who's been paying attention to current events has noticed that Americans are a fractious bunch, ready to divide themselves into an us and a them and go at each other's throats. The good news here is that it isn't just Americans who do this. We just happen to have a country that's larger than all of Europe and a media that is keen to highlight our differences and our squabbles in pursuit of ratings, so we seem more divided than other cultures and countries. But the fact of the matter is that humans are inherently tribal, So we divide ourselves into groups so easily that it's just accepted as part of our culture. As an example, consider sports teams. When we play a game of baseball, we divide ourselves into two groups, us and them, despite the fact that prior to this, we were one group. Then, based on this arbitrary grouping, we try to defeat people who up until this point were our friends by engaging in ritual warfare. And other groups of people pick a side to support while cheering for the defeat of the other. Humans are just inherently tribal, which means that we are inherently prejudicial. Now, before you leap to conclusions, let me explain what I mean. I am not saying that humans are inherently racist, sexist, or anything else like that. Those are learned behaviors. What I am saying is that humans like to prejudge things, that's what prejudice means, judging things without analysis based only on first impressions, and all the learned behaviors just make for easy lines for that prejudice. But why are humans prejudicial? Well, believe it or not, it's a survival tool from prehistory. If a plant looked funny, a caveman probably wouldn't eat it, and over time that would reduce the amount of fatalities from eating poisonous plants and fruit. Similarly, if a stranger looked funny, it likely meant that he wasn't from your tribe, but rather from the next tribe over, which meant that you were in direct competition with him for food, shelter, and other resources. And this ties in nicely with the concept of the monkey sphere that I talked about in episode 84. Human brains can only support a certain number of relationships, and everyone else just gets shoved into that other category. So unfortunately, we are wired to see the other as competition for resources, and we react aggressively. So what we are seeing today with the Berkeley riots and the increasing political schism within our country is that our culture has reached a point where we now view differing political views not as people who disagree with us, but as actual threats to our tribe. So how does one prepare for this? Well, there are two ways. First, don't have an echo chamber. Make a point to surround yourself with viewpoints that challenge you. Not only will this prevent the self-reinforcing, well, everyone I know agrees with me, therefore I must be right attitude, which is also self-defeating, but it will also help humanize the others who disagree with you. It's very, very easy to devolve to, say, well, all liberals hate us, so we must destroy them before they destroy us, if that's all you hear. Conversely, if you are actual friends with the liberal, hi Tiffany, you won't want to lump your friend into that other category, and you'll begin to see those who disagree with you not as threats to your existence, but as people. Secondly, form a tribe of your own. While that may seem counter to my previous advice, what I mean by this is forge friendships with people who aren't specifically family. If you've taken my advice about becoming friends with people who challenge your belief, Invite those people into your tribe. The more diverse your tribe is, the less susceptible you are to the prejudicial othering mentality. So in effect, my advice is have a tribe, but don't be tribal. And I know this is asking a lot, as we are fighting millions of years of psychology. But the first step to making a change is being aware of what you're doing wrong. So don't push away potential allies because you perceive them as the other. Don't turn disagreements into war. And this is something every one of us, including myself, needs to work on. Now, normally I don't jump in in the middle of your segments, 
or even at the end of your segments. But I really want to echo that. Find some people who disagree with you but aren't jerks and aren't idiots. And maybe they can explain why they believe what they believe. And suddenly, it's a lot harder to hate people who believe that stuff. Maybe you'll change their mind. You probably won't. And you shouldn't go into it looking to do that. But having somebody, in my case, it's one particular somebody, who can say, no, look, you're just using your words differently. This is how we mean it. Oh, so you're not a total idiot. Okay, cool. And suddenly, half of the people in your country stop looking like candidates for the guillotine. They start looking more like just other citizens. And your life is a whole lot better for it. Amen. Not only can you subscribe or donate to the podcast, you can also make a contribution to the LGBT Training Ammo Fund. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the LGBT Training Ammo Fund donation button in the right sidebar. I'll use this money to pay for range fees, targets, and yes, ammo for the people I teach. And thanks for your support. This week, Weird dives into the past for a few anti-gun nuts you might not have heard from in 2016. In This This Week week in Anti-Gun Nuttery. Unfortunately, the anti-gun nuttery's been pretty thin on the ground, so I dipped into my secret stash of anti-gun audio for some oldies but goodies. The first comes from Portland, Oregon a lovely choir boy on his way home from Bible study and on the way to volunteer at his local food pantry felt compelled to fire out the window of a moving car with a 9mm pistol, fatally wounding another man. This angel, who was surely trying to turn his life around, was brought before Judge Kenneth Walker, who decided that a drive-by shooting shouldn't be the craziest thing heard by the people of the court. Even as the law allows people to own and use guns, if it were left up to me from what I've seen... In 65 years of living in the communities uh, that I have, uh, if I could, I would take all the guns in America, put them on big barges, and go dump them in the ocean. Whoa! I mean, I guess I could sympathize with his sentiment, as he's a judge in a district that obviously has a gang problem. So he's equating the average citizens with gang members and thinks cops, soldiers, and security guards are the only ones who should have guns. Nobody would have a gun. Not police, not security, not anybody. We should eliminate all of them. We could save 33,000 people a year if we didn't have guns in this country. Say what? Said with an armed bailiff right beside him? And likely other officers are asked to testify and guard the prisoner during the course of the trial? I mean, go big or go home. Also note his logical misstep, where if... 33,000 people die because of guns, so therefore, if we completely got rid of guns, as impossible as that would be, under no circumstances would those people die otherwise. Of course, the bulk of those deaths are suicides, and we know that the U.S. is not vastly different in suicide rates compared to countries that have all but banned guns. And generally, gun bans lead to more gun deaths, not less. They also lead to more deaths by knives, blunt objects, and hands and feet. Australia, after a major shooting, rounded up all the guns, and they haven't had near the death that we do here in this country. Congratulations, Judge. You just got a perfect score on making a fact-free statement. Australia didn't round up all the guns, just several classes of scary guns. And while Australia has a lower gun death rate than the United States, and slightly lower violent crime rates than us, this is a consistent relationship, and not just one respective to the ban. In fact, Australia had a higher violent crime rate, including gun crimes, after the ban than before. They are a scourge of this country, and no one should have one, as far as I'm concerned. There's no defense to guns. There's, there's just uh, absolutely no reason to have them. Except for lawful self-defense, which is again 100,000 to 2 million incidents per year. Also, in light of all the people comparing Donald Trump to Hitler, can we stop ignoring firearms in defense against a tyrannical government? It is, your, it is the right of the people in this country to own and possess them, and I will not uh, say anything to affect that right. More like he legally can't say anything to affect our right to keep and bear arms. Still, notice how he stumbles and says, you're right, as if this violent gang member ever really had the right to keep and bear arms. Next is a clip I've been meaning to cover. This was from that delightful bunch we know as ABC's The View. This was a show directly after the terrorist attack on the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. 
I find it interesting what Americans do. When there's a tragedy, we all come together in love, which is wonderful. But how long does it really last? It doesn't last for very long. It's like two months, we talk about gun control, we have to stop it, and then it just dissipates and we go back to Twitter. This is Raven Simone, who is the member of The View who identifies as LGBT, who was given the floor to speak for the victims of The Pulse. Really, she got it exactly backwards. In reality, Americans come together after a tragedy. Until either somebody on the right starts talking about banning certain people, or someone on the left starts talking about banning guns. We can't be united in loving when one side or the other is actively blaming innocent people for a crime they didn't commit. He said if they had guns, this, they would have been able to defend themselves. Well, in fact, there was a security guard outside of the Pulse uh, this weekend who had a gun. They exchanged fire, and the guy went right past him with his assault weapons weapon and killed 50 people. This is alleged comedian Joy Behar referencing Trump's rhetoric on gun-free zones and the slaughterhouses they become. In the case of the Pulse, they didn't have guns because Florida bans carry in any establishment that serves alcohol. There was one man, a uniformed police officer, who was armed, and the killer was aware of him and engaged him while he was already inside the building. The cop was stuck between the safety of his car and the killer who was already inside, and he chose the former and retreated to his car to call for help while the defenseless people inside were slaughtered without mercy. Nobody who was trapped inside with a killer was armed. You can be on a no-fly no list in this country, not be allowed to get on a plane because you, but if you're on that no-fly list, you can buy an assault rifle in this country. Did you catch that? You could not be allowed on a plane because... Because what? She didn't say because she likely knows. Because nothing. There has never been a terrorist attack in the United States where the terrorist was on the list. Meanwhile, there are millions of names on these lists, and these people are not terrorists. The terror watch list is utter crap, and the only discussion about it should be when to scrap it. More than 90% of Americans are, are for gun control. Hillary Clinton has come out and proposed reinstating the assault weapons ban that expired in 2004 under George W. Bush. Of course, this was said months before the fateful election the election where the majority of Americans rejected gun control and rejected Hillary Clinton. It would be more amusing if this complete lie wasn't still being recited by anti-gun nuts today. It's about a lot of different things, you know. It's about a, a, an amendment in the Constitution that people misread. The Constitution doesn't say you can carry hundreds of guns. It says you can, you can protect your home. It says you can protect yourself. It doesn't say get 55 guns. Ah, uh, the infinite wisdom of Whoopi Goldberg. Let's set aside the absurdity of someone carrying hundreds of guns. Where does it say in the Constitution how many guns I can carry? Or own? Also, where does it say the right to keep and bear arms is just for protecting the home? Seems Whoopi isn't afraid to talk about what she doesn't know or understand. You can't hunt anything with an assault rifle. You can't do it. There's nothing left after you... Ah, the old, there's nothing left if you hunt with an assault weapon trope. Because Whoopi's spent a whole lot of time in a deer stand, probably about as much as he spent studying ballistic data or even learning what is and what is not an assault weapon. There's a reason why their side is losing. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Plug of the Week, the American Warrior Podcast. Now, I know I've talked about this before. It's one of the podcasts I listen to every week. Well, every other week, but now it's every week. It used to be every two. And yes, they tend to get a little long, but they get pretty in-depth. The American Warrior Podcast is Mike Seeklander, who you should know from Best Defense. Uh, he's a famous trainer. Uh, used to be the, I think he was in charge of, but he certainly was a trainer. For the U.S. Air Marshals, I think he was actually in charge of that. The guy knows what he's talking about, and he knows a lot of people who know what they're talking about, so you should listen in. This something that happened on the podcast, it was well, by the time you listen to this, it'll be about three weeks ago. He had an interview with a guy named Mike Pannone. Now, Mike Pannone is a former Delta, former Special Forces, former Marine, right? So there's your culture clash right uh -uh. there. He started out uh -uh. as a Marine. Yeah, 
<laughs> you you never are a former or ex marine unless you've been like dishonorably discharged. No, nah, he's former. He joined the army. He's army now. He's ours. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> Shots fired! Shots fired! <laughs> I'm not gonna touch that one. We can say that he's a marine veteran. How about that? Okay. In any case. He left the Marine Corps and transferred into the Army to be in the Special Forces, and from there he went to selection, failed, went to selection again and made it into Delta Force, or whatever Delta Force is actually called. Between the two of them, they got to talking about things that people say in the gun industry or in the gun blogosphere or in the gun universe that just irritate the crap out of them. Now, this is Mike Seeklander starting. One of my pet peeves is... Um, the, the instructors out there that copy the saying that, you know, smooth is fast and blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and here's my thought on that. Smooth, if I'm a high-level shooter and I'm, I'm okay, you know, but I, I may look really, really smooth, but it has nothing to do with me trying to be smooth. I, in other words, I don't go to, a, to the practice range and say, I'm going to work on my smoothness today. I work on what you just said. I work on the tiny minutia pieces of the technique. And when I, when I improve upon those, I automatically look smoother and I gain speed and maintain accuracy. So that's the kind of stuff you're going to get out of him is real in depth, how he's doing what he's doing. And this is a guy who decided one day that he was going to be a competition shooter. He's going to start shooting competitions when he was in the Marine Corps. And then he ended up being a police officer and he became and, you know, now he's a grandmaster. He competes. He's sponsored. So Mike Seeklander is a very, very good shooter. So what did Mike Pannone, former Delta Force guy, former Special Forces Marine veteran, have to say about the slow is smooth? One of my big pet peeves is saying things that have no meaning or that are factually incorrect. And so the slow is smooth, smooth is fast thing is kind of insulting to me almost intellectually. I mean, if slow is smooth and smooth is fast, then slow is fast, which is factually incorrect. Okay, right. it just, it's a math problem that doesn't work, first of all. Second of all, slow is just slow. I mean, just straight up, man. That's just the way it is. Slow is just slow. You need to get these guys that T-shirt that you talked about a couple of weeks ago. Slow is smooth and also slow. <laughs> exactly. What we need to do is we need to convince Atlanta Arms that they need to put that shirt on Teespring and then just turn it loose. They would sell a bajillion of those shirts. So you heard it here, and it's not just me saying it. It's some of the best shooters in the world. Slow is smooth and also slow. Slow is slow. You can listen to the American Warrior podcast on iTunes, I think Stitcher Radio. Just look for it wherever you find your podcasts. Well, that's our show for the week. Remember that the Gun Blog Variety Cast is a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Find the show notes at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode 130. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast. Music courtesy of Rob Allen at blog.roballen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Music. This podcast is made possible by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by contributions from listeners like you. This is a URS production.